I guess I'm here to uh, follow my friend Senator Graham and bring the uh, opposing view uh, regarding uh, Mr. Barr. I want to offer my appreciation to the chairman as he leaves for the way he conducted the hearing. I know that he offered his appreciation to the ranking member, um, but the hearing I thought was well handled, uh, decorous. Everybody got a chance to ask their questions and say their things, and I think uh, the comments that the chairman made afterwards about trying to bring the committee together were well received uh, on my side. There are a number of problems, however, that I have with this nominee. Um, many of them relate to continuing problems in the uh, department. Uh, one in particular I warned uh, Mr. Barr about in a letter that I sent to him beforehand in order to um, make sure that he wasn't surprised by the question and that I could get a proper, thoughtful answer. And the problem is that the department, for purposes of recusal analysis and for purposes of conflicts analysis, takes a look at what people's different financial entanglements are, who they've worked for before. It's a fairly standard process, but there's a big gaping hole in it. And the big gaping hole in the process is that when it was set up originally at the beginning of the Obama administration, the Supreme Court hadn't yet decided Citizens United. So the flood of unlimited special interest money that poured into our politics that quickly became unlimited special interest dark money was not then a problem. Also, you didn't see a lot of Democrats coming to high office that had a lot of engagement with dark money. But with the Trump administration, that all changed, and we now have an acting attorney general, Mr. Whitaker, who was paid $1.2 million through a group called FACT, F-A-C-T. Basically, FACT is a front group. It does no business, it has no product, it provides no service. It basically just pays Mr. Whitaker, to go on talk shows and uh, criticize Democrats. There were very few employees. Uh, the only employee that I'm aware of, other than perhaps clerical people, was actually Whitaker himself. So one would like to know why he was paid that money and who paid him in order to do proper recusal and conflict checks. But here's what's interesting. The money that came in to pay him through fact, before it got to fact, had been laundered through another group called Donors Trust. Donors Trust is another group that does no business, has no service, creates no product, manufactures nothing. Its purpose for existence is to strip the identities off of big donors, ordinarily it seems big Republican special interest donors, so that the money that they then give goes anonymously to groups that can then pretend they're not fossil fuel funded, for instance, because the identity of the fossil fuel donor has been stripped clean, or they're not a tool of the Koch brothers because the Koch brothers' identity has been stripped clean. It's a device for misleading and confusing people. But when you consider how much of that million dollars went through to Mr. Whitaker in salary, the idea that he doesn't know who was paying him when so much of fax money came through that one do donation, it's really improbable. Uh, he was questioned on this in the House the other day. I don't think he was truthful. I think he does know. Uh, and I hope, hope, that the House will pursue with subpoenas, finding out who the donor was so that we actually know, because I think he does, and I'm sure obviously the donor knows. So what we have now is a situation in which the Acting Attorney General of the United States has a potentially million-dollar conflict of interest that I believe the Acting Attorney General knows about, that the donor with whom he has the conflict of interest obviously knows about, that's been hidden from the rest of us by laundering it through donors' trust, and that is not an environment that is conducive to proper recusal and proper conflict of interest assessment. It's very poor practice, 
And if it weren't for the fact that dark money was so important to big Republican donor interests, I think people would readily clear this up. If the shoe were on the other foot, my colleagues on the other side would be steam coming out of their ears to get to the bottom of this. But because what's likely to be revealed is a big Republican donor, suddenly there's this massive disinterest. But Mr. Barr proposed himself as the person who was going to come to this office to defend the Department of Justice, to put the institutional interests of the Department of Justice first, to protect it from the vagaries of the Trump administration. And yet, when he was asked about this, he completely fell down. He offered no sensible or reasonable uh, assurances. So that concerned me a little bit. I then went on to ask him, since the Department of Justice has a national security division which oversees counterintelligence work, and since the Department of Justice contains the FBI, which does the counterintelligence investigations that protect our country, I asked him in a counterintelligence uh, investigation in operating to protect our country and its counterintelligence function, what should the Department of Justice know about business or other entanglements of senior officials with foreign interests and powers? The very heart of counterintelligence is to look at American officials and see what their vulnerabilities might be to influence or control or manipulation by foreign interests and powers. That's the goal of doing counterintelligence in the first place. So what evidence do you need to be able to do that? Well, it would obviously be helpful to know what business or other interests with foreign powers senior officials have so that you can make that assessment, so you can follow whatever leads that might produce. That may give you understanding of things that otherwise seem inexplicable. It is obvious evidence to support the FBI's counterintelligence function. But rather than give a straight answer that said, yeah, this is obvious evidence, and obviously we'll do our counterintelligence function better if we know when senior officials have uh, foreign business entanglements, again, he completely fell down in his answer and started quarreling about what senators have to declare and wouldn't give a, a straight answer. Well, there's an obvious reason he wouldn't give a straight answer. The obvious reason he would not give a straight answer is that the president who appointed him has significant, although we don't understand them well yet, significant business entanglements that we don't know about. And we need to find out what his business entanglements are. And it's really hard to assess some of his behavior without knowing who's on the other side of his foreign business relationships and how much money is involved and how much is at risk for him. That's pretty elementary stuff. And if you're the person who is selling yourself as the attorney general who's gonna come in and be the institutionalist and defend the prerogatives of the department and defend the procedures and the protocols of the department against a president who respects none of that and who has those very entanglements to then come in and say, you know what, nah, no, 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 I'm, I'm not gonna be interested in, in, in any of that. I'm gonna instead ask counter questions uh, back to you about other different officials the inability to give a straight answer to that question signals a great deal to me about when in a pinch he has to choose between defending the department and protecting the political interests of the president, which way he's going to go. Because I gave him that choice in that question. I gave him that choice in that question. He very clearly came down on the side of protecting the political interests of the president. If you can't get through a hearing question, without flipping away from the interests of the department and protecting the president, good luck when the pressure is really on. So he lost enormous credibility with me in his inability to answer those questions. It is really hard to determine recusals or conflict of interest if you don't know who paid a million dollars to a senior department official and it is really hard to determine counterintelligence 
issues if you don't know what foreign entanglements senior officials have. And those are statements that I would hope would be so obvious as to be indisputable. And yet, this candidate foundered on both of them. The other issue is the question of executive power. Again, you would think that the Senate would be interested in standing up for its prerogatives as a legislative body, since we are a legislative body, and we have a very long and proud tradition. From that perspective, as a senator, as a legislator, I look ahead and I see constitutional battles. There are a lot of constitutional battles that I see coming. The first is going to be if the president, when he gets or after he gets the uh, budget measure that we've agreed to here, I hope we've agreed to here, I think it's done, uh, if he decides that he's going to declare a national emergency and start moving money around from between accounts in order to build his, as I affectionately refer to it, big dumb wall. Well, that's a constitutional problem because Article I of the Constitution says it's the legislature that has the power to appropriate and spend funds. So if the president is going to use his own unilateral declara declaration of a national emergency to say to Congress, sorry, your power of the purse is not actually all that real. It's just a power of advice to me. As soon as I declare a national emergency, I can spend your money where I want. That violates the separation of powers. That is a constitutional battle, and one can see it coming. Executive privilege is a constant constitutional battle between Congress and the executive branch. Congress wants information. Congress seeks information. Congress needs information to perform its constitutional oversight function. But certain narrow communications within the executive branch are protected from Congress's right to do that in order to protect certain conversations and freedoms directly around the President of the United States as he has conversations. That's the general understanding of how executive privilege works. Well, this administration has a very different understanding of how executive privilege works. They think that you get to come into a Senate hearing and not answer a question because someday maybe somebody else might assert executive privilege as to what you've been said as to what you have said, but there is no deadline ever, there is no check ever, there is no day of reckoning ever. They just assert it, and then because we have non-enforced uh, our powers here, they've gotten away with it. So executive privilege has grown into a swamp of executive obstruction of congressional oversight. We gotta bring executive privilege back to its true base and its true roots. And as we try to do that, guess what? That's going to be another battle between the legislative and executive branches, another constitutional battle. The question of whether or not the president can be indicted by a grand jury is another constitutional battle we have coming, very likely. We'll have to see what the special counsel and the other Department of Justice investigations into this president and the people around him reveal, but they could very well reveal sufficient evidence to justify an indictment of anyone else who was not the president. Within the Department of Justice, there is a group called the Office of Legal Counsel, which is kind of the legal advisor to the Department of Justice, and the Office of Legal Counsel has decided that a Department of Justice cannot indict a sitting president. Now, here's the problem with that. The Office of Legal Counsel isn't elected by anybody. They're career people. They tend to be hyper smart. But their purpose in life, in opining on the separation of powers questions, is to describe the maximum possible credible scope of executive power. They represent the executive branch, and when they're making these separation of powers decisions, they always veer to the maximum greatest executive power that they can justify. That does not mean that a court would agree with them. That does not mean that a court would agree with them. And ever since Marbury versus Madison, it has been the constitutional 
power of the courts, particularly the Supreme Court, to say what the law is. And the question of whether a president can be indicted or not is a question of what the law is regarding the indictment of a president. So that question ought to be decided in a court. But if the Office of Legal Counsel is never going to let a case go forward, then how is the department ever going to get that opinion that it has tested in court to get a real answer under the constitutional system? Well, they probably won't. It's going to be difficult. We all get, we're going to have to try to find a way, if they do assert that, to get that proposition tested in a court instead of relying on the opinion of a group of lawyers within an executive branch agency as to the relative powers of uh, the courts and the executive branch. The um, question of interference with these investigations by the president and the independence of those investigations also raises a variety of constitutional questions. And I have to say the top line of Mr. Barr on all of these issues was fantastic. I was kind of mentally cheering when he said some of the things that he said about how he was going to keep his hands off, how he respected Mueller, how this was no witch hunt, how the, he was going to make sure it had its full scope, how he was going to try to get the maximum transparency about the final report that he could, all of which was fine. And then we went into the, to the weeds a little bit. And as the old saying goes, the devil is in the details. The question was serious enough that I raised it in the committee after the hearing, because I was unsatisfied with his responses, and, and Chairman Graham was kind enough to acknowledge that those are pretty darn good questions and I should get an answer to them. He said that he would uh, try to get an answer for me and maybe we'd even get on the phone together with Barr to get those answers. That did not come to pass, so instead I wrote him a letter, Mr. Barr, asking him to clarify his answers. And I got back a letter that provided no clarification at all. So I've given him quite a few chances to try to answer these questions, and I haven't gotten a straight answer back, which makes me a little bit worried. Here is the problem. There are actually two problems. At the end of the day, whenever the Mueller report is concluded, that report can be provided to Congress, but there is considerable flexibility and considerable discretion within the Department of Attorney, within the Department of Justice and the Attorney General's office as to how much to give. Uh, Madam President, as I was wrapping up, I was pointing out that at some point there is likely to be a report that comes out of the special counsel investigation, and there will be some material in that report that is properly stripped out of it before it's provided to the public. The two things that I concede are proper to strip out of it are classified national security information that could reveal sources and methods of uh, our intelligence operations. And the second is pr private and personal information, particularly related to witnesses that is not necessary to the public understanding of the report. People's phone numbers or email addresses or other uh, private information. Those are very clearly appropriate to redact from the report. But there are two other ways in which the Department of Justice could go into the Mueller report and just gouge great tranches of material out. One would be if an assertion by the president was made of executive privilege. And if without any contest or without any formative review or court review, the Attorney General simply agreed with the assertion of executive privilege by the President. We have seen these extreme, almost wild, unlimited assertions of executive privilege by members of the Trump administration. There's never been any discipline or proper process about it. There's never been any enforcement. Um, so it is a wide open field for mischief. 
if the president decides that big chunks of the Mueller report shouldn't be disclosed to the public because he asserts executive privilege, and then Attorney General Barr says, good enough for me, I'm not going to let any of that go uh, to the public or to Congress. That, to me, is a problem. And that door is wide open, and it's a reason uh, that I have for my opposition to this particular nominee. The other is related. There's a long-standing tradition at the Department of Justice that when you're undertaking a criminal investigation and you develop in the course of that investigation derogatory information about people, particularly about uncharged people, you don't get to just spill that out into the public record. The bad deed that was done by Jim Comey was to violate that department rule and disclose derogatory investigative information about an uncharged person, specifically Mrs. Clinton. And that violated long-standing procedures and principles of the department and kicked up a lot of uh, criticism, including by me, right at the time and since, uh, and also by Attorney General Barr. And he stands, I think, uh, in the best traditions of the department to condemn the release of derogatory investigative information about an uncharged person. The rule as a prosecutor is if you're going to say it, say it in your pleadings. Charge the guy. Put it in the indictment. Put it in the criminal information. Then the defense can fairly react. Then you're accountable to the court for what you're saying. And then there's some discipline to it. But you don't get to describe unrelated or uncharged conduct that just happens to be um, derogatory. So, and that actually continues on through the whole criminal case. You're not supposed to do it at any point. If you've got something to say about the evidence in the case, you plead it in a pleading before the court, and otherwise you keep your mouth shut and you stand on your pleadings. The problem comes when that rule gets applied in this case. And here's the circumstance. The Mueller report comes down. It's full of investigation, of, of information, of derogatory information about the president and the people around him. But because the Office of Legal Counsel, as I described earlier, has decided that you can't charge a sitting president with a crime, now that president is an uncharged person. Not because there wasn't an indictment to be brought against him, not because he didn't engage in criminal conduct, not because the government wouldn't ordinarily prosecute that case to the full extent of the law, but simply because of this little policy at the Office of Legal Counsel that you can't indict a sitting president, one that has never been tested in court, and one that I think fares badly in court if you look at the precedents of Nixon and Clinton and others. So now, with the president as an uncharged person, do you then call in this doctrine and say, hey, all derogatory investigative information about this uncharged person is now no longer amenable to disclosure to Congress or the public. That ought to be, it's a complicated situation, but it's easy to get there. And once you're there, the answer ought to be, well, obviously no. But I couldn't get that answer. I couldn't get a straight answer. So over and over and over again, despite the terrific top line assertions that Mr. Barr made, when you drill down into the weeds, you couldn't get a straight answer. And when you tried, very often it was an easy answer to make and you couldn't get that easy straight answer. And in those cases, it was a choice between the policies and the protocols and the propriety of the Department of Justice versus the political interests of the president. So if I can't get a good, get a good answer in a simple hearing question that properly puts the weight where it belongs to support the protocols and the procedures and the propriety of the Department of Justice, then when it's not so public, 
and when the pressure is really on, and when hard decisions have to be made, it's impossible for me to believe that he won't lean towards yielding to the president rather than defending and honoring the department. That, for me, is enough reason to oppose this nomination. And with that, I yield the floor.